Okay, uh, now the second part of uh, Brown's family. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Iris Brown, uh, please, uh, talking from here, Iris is uh, um, a senior lecturer uh, at the Ono Academic College, and her main research field is uh, Orthodox Judaism, with focus on halakha, Hasidism, gender, and Jewish uh, nationalism. Uh, and she will speak about uh, uh, Bet Yaakov, Sarah Schneer, between uh, Hasidism and uh, Neo-Orthodoxy, Sarah Schneer, between two worlds, please. Shalom Nikulam. Sarah Schneer, the founder of the Bet Yaakov School for Girls in Krakow, achieved something remarkable. Alre already in her lifetime, the school had grown into the largest educa educational network in the Jewish world, according, in the Jewish world. According to Schneer, own words, she was inspired to establish the school by the Torah and Derech Eretz approach adopted by neo-Orthodox German Jewry. The school operated more or less according to this approach, at least until Schneider's. However, in this lecture, I will argue that the school was founded not only on the Torah and Derech Eretz, uh, uh, Eretz ideology, but also integrated a number of Hasidic ideas into in its uh, in echo of Schneer on all early spiritual roots. I will also examine to what degree they were integrated with the pr principles of neo-orthodoxy, which seem so different from their first gallons. A look at Sarah Schneer's biography can teach us about her source of inspiration and her motivation for founding Beit Yaakov. Schneer was born in 1883 to a family of Bezler Hasidim, one of the most conservative and militant Hasidic groups in Galicia. Like many young Jewish women in Galicia, she was went to public school, but she left her studies after elementary school in order to help support her family and become a seamstress. Already as a young girl, she felt different from her friends who nicknamed her Hasida. She, kneel, uh, she keenly observed the commandments and she often preferred to sit and read the weekly Torah portion rather than going out with her friends. Her friends. As she grew older, she was constantly surprised to discover that unlike her, many of the girls around her were lax in their advance, uh, observance, from blessing to kashrut to Shabbat. And when they did perform commandments such as prayer, they often did apathically without intention or passion. From Schneer's accounts in various sources, she seems to have understood the goals of the generation could not avoid the influence of the environment all around them. In the morning, they were sent to public school where they were exposed to negative sentiments toward Judaism and everything Jewish appeared ugly and fanatic to them. At the same time, their education at home was lacking, a problem Schneer attributed to parents and especially to mother who were responsible for their children's education in practice. Rather than telling their children about a great Jewish leader or the miracle of experience by Jewish people, mother would tell their children tales about fairies and witches. She was also upset by the influence of the secular youth movement in which the girl participated after school and on weekends. This movement further reinforced their negative attitude toward Judaism. Schneer's memory, memory repeatedly reflected her desire to save the fellow, fellow women from their religious laxity and their ignorance of Judaism and to return them to the religious fold. According to her description, the fulfillment of this dream would make her the happiest person in the world, and it's in her, in her words, seven times happier than any millionaires. This feeling only grew stronger over the course of her time in Vienna, Vienna during World War I. Schneerer fled there with her family alongside many of Krakow's Jewish. There she was exposed to dif different reality. In Vienna, women played a central role in the Jewish community. They were present for prayer and the rabbi's ceremony and observed Torah and mitzvot while remaining open to the modern environment around them. Schneerer became aware to that fact that something was lacking in Eastern European Jewry. I quote, it struck me that our major problem is that our sister in Poland know so little about our history which aliens them from our people and its tradition. 
Based on this, Schneider decided to establish an educational formal uh, framework for a Jewish girl. First, she started an informal education program, which was a failure. Then, she moved on to the establishment of formal educational institution, a school for girls starting in the first grade. Schneider did not hide the influence neo-orthodoxy had on her. In fact, she wrote about it and discussed it in various uh, contexts. The approach of Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, the founder of German uh, neo-orthodoxy, was not only a source of in inspiration for Schneider, it was also central to the institution she founded. And Hirsch's writing were a major part of the curriculum uh, she designed. Even before Schneer came up with the former curriculum, she studied and taught Schneer Hirsch's works along with other texts from Germany, such as the writing of Dr. Markus Meyer Lehmann. Until 1934, the school in Bet Yaakov network did not have systematic pragmatical approach or basic textbook likewise. There was no official seminary that would train teachers for the network. However, after Agudat Israel took Bet Yaakov under its wing, radical change took place that further increased the influence of the Wein Der Heretz. Dr. Leo, uh, Shmuel Leo Deutschlander, who was in charge of Karen Torah, the Agudat Foundation for the Support of Orthodox Schools, were a fervent follower of this ideology. He threw himself into the advances of Bet Yaakov and took responsibility for all the tasks related to the institution. He initiated a summer training course for teachers, established seminars for teachers in Krakow and Vienna, developed curricula, and brought teachers to the seminaries. According to several testimonies, Schneerer sometimes disagreed with Deutschlander with regard to the extent of the neo-orthodoxy influence on Bet Yaakov. However, as I have noted, she too saw the neo-orthodox approach in a positive light, supported it, and took part in it. That said, she didn't think of it as the only leading principle. Alongside the intellectual, uh, intellectual emphasis of Torah der Eret, she wanted to inspire a more emotional religious experience in, this, in her students, like she experienced she had known from her Hasidic upbringing. This was realized in a few different ways. Schneer placed a heavy emphasis on singing and igunim, as well as on prayer. She encouraged outing in nature as a religious experience. Her speech and homilies were written in a style that resembled those of the Hasidism. The f this phenomenon may even be present in the model of educational leadership uh, she adopted, a model that called the mind a Hasidic rebbe, although it was certainly different and much more sadder. Now we will briefly analyze each of these Hasidic elements. Schneer grew up in a strong Hasidic home, and her brother eventually became close to the Belzer rebbe, Rabbi Issachar Dov Rokach. The rabbi gave Schneer this blessing on the opening of the Bet Yaakov school, telling her Bruch of Atzlucho, blessing and success. This event was very important for Schneer. Likewise, the granddaughter of the Tzanzer rabbi helped her to establish the school. Her connection to the Hasidic world helping her to advance her vision. However, rather than focusing on the practical ties of the Hasidic world, I would like to relate the essential of her education approach, prayer, nigun, joy, and her own almost rebel-like leadership. The subject of prayer was very close to Schneer on heart. Uh, according to the Jewish law, women are required to pray twice a day. In practice, however, women did not pray at all, or at most pray only the memory uh, morning service. I have already noted Schneerer dismay that the prayer of Jewish women often had no intention or feeling. Schneerer brought, brought about a real revolution in women's prayer education. She made prayer into an integral and meaningful aspect of the seminary. She found it. On Shabbat, she insists on t attending public prayer service with the seminary girls at almost uh, any cost even in the rain in chilly weather. For example, one Shabbat, when a storm raged outside, the girl tried to talk her of going to the synagogue uh, and asked to pray together where they were. But Schneer insisted that they go 
and she backed up her words with her homily. She interpreted a verse from Tehillim, we walk trembling in God's house, which means Vivet Elohim Nalech Beregesh, as follows. The letter of the word Beregesh stands for Barad, Ruach, Geshem, Veshelet, which means uh, wind, rain, snow, and hell, before. That is even under those conditions we must walk to God's house. This homily, it must be noted, is a Hasidic in spirit, and it's hard to find the protection of the kind of the German or orthodoxy. In the end of the story, I quote, when she was finishing speaking, everyone walked together to the synagogue, happy and light-hearted. Schneer also faithfully attended prayer service on Shabbat Eve. In Krakow, it was known that single women did not go to the prayer on Shabbat Eve. However, Schneer insisted on walking with the seminary girls to the Ramah synagogue and praying there, despite the objection of the married woman at the synagogue. In letter to her students, she dedicated a long and detailed letter to the importance of prayer and intention in prayer. In her writing, she emphasized in the spirit of Hasidism also the idea of preparation before prayer and reading out, writing one's mind of virgin thoughts. In the summer course that took place in the first year of the seminary, standing in 1925 in the mountain of Poland, we hear how Sarah Schneer would wake up the seminary goal and lead them into the mountains to pray the early morning Vatican service. She taught that prayer in a nature caused the goal in a marvel at the work of the creator and made the prayer more meaningful. Expression of this kind can be found throughout her writings. Likewise, the idea that all of nature has, so, has a song and that prayer of man elevates nature in its ultimate thoughts can be found her, in her work. At one of the summer courses, after she fervently prayed the ticking with a student, she told them, I quote, in the holy book, it is said that when every stem and leaf sings, the, <coughs> they aspire to be included in the prayer of Jew. And when one prays, in the field, he raised them up with his prayer. For this reason, I choose to pray in the field today and to do an act of kindness for the grass and the leaves of the trees. It is not hard to identify an echo of the famous word of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev in Shirata Asabim, the songs of the grasses, which was the base of a marvelous song by Nomi Shemel. Here we see the well-known idea of rising up the sparks and the idea that Holiness can be found everywhere, and the argument that everything has its own unique value. Song and nigun were also an important uh, element of Schneer's lessons to her students. This calls to mind the uh, centrality of the nigun in Hasidism as a means to fill one's heart with joy and cleave to God. Schneer adopted songs and nigunim and transferred them into part of the experience of the Bet Yaakov Seminary. There, was, there were a few students that even served in the role of uh, musicians, similar that to Baal Menagen in Hasidism. She was delighted to listen to the solo sang by one of the girls who had been chosen in the singer and sang world of Torah. The importance of simcha, joy, may also remind us of the Hasidic way, not only on the concrete level, but in theological level. On a concrete level, as I have shown, singing nigunim and dancing were usually meant to create a joyous atmosphere. On theological level, Schneer spoke with her students often about the virtue of joy. For instance, Schneer explained that one who prays when he is in sadness and full of sorrow, prays for himself. On the other hand, one who prays when he is in sim simcha, prays for the crea creator alone. And I quote, during praying of this kind, his only ambition to fu fulfill the wish of the creator with all his heart and all his soul and all his substance. This word bring, me, uh, bring to mind the Hasidic term of dvekut, cleaving to God. Finally, we must relate to Schneer's educational leadership. Schneer was not just an educator, but charismatic leader eagerly watched and heeded by her students. This was not the behavior of a rep per se. Her students were not required to attach themselves 
uh, to her on a spiritual practical level, and of course, she had no official title, but however, it would appear that Schneerer replaced the male title Rav, Rebbe, with the word Mame. Whenever she went, she was nicknamed Mame, or the mother of daughter of Israel. This nickname shows both intimacy and authority behind, uh, authority behind the ordinary status of a school principal. Every Shabbat, Schneer would give the great Torah speeches peppered with stories and moral messages. Often, she did not name her sources, but the names that do appear are the name of Hasidic Rebbe, like Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch of Riminov, Rabbi Simcha Bruni of Shisre, and Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdiches. Many of her Divrei Torah were in Hasidic style, with the emphasis I listed earlier. Here, too, it is important to note that this type of education leadership was not characteristic of Western European Jewry. The Kvitelach sent to Rebbe were replaced by a huge number of letters from girls in towns and cities across Europe, as well as letters from uh, teachers and other grown women. Schneerer would stay awake late into the night to answer all the letters. Before I conclude my remark, I will finish with a, a memoir from one of her students that I believe includes all the points I have made thus far, and that illustrates the Hasidic-like atmosphere of the seminary in Krakow. Uh, I quote, and here she appears, the glowing Yiddish mama in white pine for she enters and Shabbat in the room, where, uh, and Shabbat is in the room. We felt that the extra soul of Shabbat and entered with her. She was overflowing with holiness and purity, and she showered us in holiness and love. We went to the synagogue to pray. You have surely heard of the prayer of Shara Shnirer, who had has not seen her pray, had never seen her prayer in his life. During the prayer, she seemed like one standing in conversation with the Holy One, the Lord of all the world, the beloved of her soul. After the prayer service, we went home and all sang Shalom Aleichem together. She made Kiddush on the wine and she went to the wash, and then we went to wash our hand. We fled them an angel and peace, we felt that an angel of peace was hovering in the room, an angel of love was wandering about in the modest room. We felt that we were in a holy citadel, kind of a little temple, and she was the high priest. In summary, Sarah Schneer wanted to make Bet Yaakov into an institution that would do much more than merely passing along knowledge. She wanted to shape her student's character and to give their studies a deep religious and experiential dimension. Schneer as well have seen largely a job of the Torah in their Eretz ideology. However, this ideology was only elements of Schneer's vision for the seminary. She also infused to institute with the Hasidic spirit in a various way. way. Uh, Hasidism and Torah in Derech Eretz are often understood as approaches that contradict one another, both in their content and in the atmosphere they create. However, it appears that Schneer did not understand that as an ideological or theological system but rather that educational tools for, uh, that could serve different aspects of the educational process she aimed to build. Sarah Schneerer was not theologian and certainly not systematic philosopher of religion. Mostly, she asked herself what will work the best and did not worry about the potential contradiction between them. As she said, her aim was to return Jewish gold to their roots empower them and help them take pride of their people. This pragmatic approach led to the combination of elements that seem contradictory at the first glance, but eventually work well together in the practice and made Bet Yaakov an educational success story. Unlike this appeal of Hasidism or neo-orthodoxy, Schneerer did not see uh, these ideologies as, as all consuming or binding. Instead, she understood them as an educational tool that could help her for create a holistic institution for girls. This institution would allow her to cultivate the goal and to protect their Judaism in the broader sense 
of the world, uh, leading them to observe Torah and mitzvot and to pass these values on the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. It's really remarkable that uh, we started 15 minutes uh, late and, and we just uh, finished on time. Uh, then since then, if anybody has any question, remarks, comments, please do. Yeah, Tamara. Thank you for this really wonderful presentation. Um, I was wondering if you saw in any, um, any reflection from maybe, I don't know, the students or some sort of self-conscious reflection by Sarah Schneer about this fact that they're blending, or the fact that they're blending these different kind of worldviews, right? As you say, it's not presented systematically, but is there some sense there of, are they, are they labeling these? Are they saying this is sort of like Hasidism, this is more like neo-orthodoxy? Uh, I think that Sarah Schneer tried to speak to all of the girls. She wants uh, her school to be as large as she can. And when she went uh, to collect the students, she always speak to them in what they want to hear, I mean to their parents. If they want to, be, to hear that the school is very struck, she speaks like, like this idea. If they want to hear that it's open-minded, she speaks like this idea. And there are a few letters that you surely can see this uh, type of uh, behavior. And uh, I think she see it, as I wrote, that she, she really wants to save the girls from uh, the modernity influence that uh, take them away from Judaism. Okay, Hevrei, Hevraya. Kahal Kadosh, Todah Rabbah, thank you very much. We are going to lunch now.